on the Hudson River tunnels, which is progressing separately. But uh, the portal bridge is the big news. Uh, the new bridge will be two tracks, which I question. It should be at least three so that you can always take one out of service and keep bi-directional traffic running. But that's you know, people paid a lot more than me to figure that stuff out. But um, so that's the that's the biggest news on the NJ Transit side. It's now fall and leaf season. So the aqua trains are running. Those are kind of neat because they're a string of tank cars with this odd looking cab, uh, flat car with a cab on it. And they run around the commuter systems, the, the commute, the, the revenue routes uh, with soap and water, tank cars full of soapy water and they clean, they spray the leaf oils off the rail. That way the locomotives can maintain traction because um, there's so many station stops. The local, you know, the NJ Transit stations are so close together, a lot of starting and stopping. So they're the only railroad in the country that runs these aqua trains. They're fun to watch. Um, they move slow, so you don't have to worry about, uh, you know, being being afraid of the things. But they're, it's an interesting operation. You only see on NJ Transit. And the GP40s, the Jersey Central GP40 is back in service. It's been out of service for a few weeks. Uh, it's been running on the Mars and Essex line, so you can see it out this way for a while, but that assignment changes daily. Um, I get to see some of the uh, schedules each day, uh, of the rotations at each set of locomotives, and it's impressive how NJ Transit schedules these things, but uh, the, uh, the blue GP40 has been on the, Mar has been on the Mars and Essex and Booten lines uh, last, or probably most of this week. Um, the new dual modes, two of them are in service, so they're uh, you can tell them because they're the ones with the clean stripes. The uh, the older engines, the stripes are starting to fade. They're decals, and uh, I'm trying to think what else is uh, big with NJ Transit. Um, are we ready to go, or do you need more news? Uh, we're all set up on Facebook, Mike, so uh, we're ready to roll. All right. Well, once again, would like to thank the presenters tonight. Um, Conrail's Conrail was one of the leaders in track design and track maintenance during the 1980s and 90s. It's uh, when 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 they got President L. Stanley Crane from the Southern Railway. Southern the Southern Railway was known for its fine track, and Stanley Crane brought that tradition to Conrail. So Conrail be, quickly became a leader in track design, track maintenance. Uh, and and just keeping up track it, lots of lots of clean ballast new rail and it had a fleet of track geometry equipment that was uh, among the finest in the country and a lot of it and our presenters tonight uh did a book on conrail's track maintenance equipment and the and the, the rail cars that were used for track geometry and i'm looking very forward to hearing all the details of it um, during my era, my years as a as a railroad journalist, I got to cover a lot of that. And when I was uh, for two years, I was the engineering editor of Railway Track and Structure, so I got to talk to the Conrail guys and would get calls from them on their trains as they're doing stuff. It was it's a pretty impressive operation. So I'd like to turn the show over. Thank you, gentlemen, for bringing this to us and for producing your book. Thank you, appreciate it, and thanks to Richie as well. Uh, we'll get started here. Uh, I'll do introductions for Brock and I in just a second, but I wanted to um, to start with this picture uh, on purpose. Many of you, uh, when you hear about business trains and uh, 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 you know office car specials, whatever you call it, executive trains, you think of E8s and F units, and you think of really shiny, uh, usually historical rail cars behind them. But the reality is, is that um, they were so much more than just the steel. Um, and they were much more about connecting with people. And I think that was the thing that Brock and I learned as we went down this path of writing the book, that this was about the Conrail people. It was about connecting with customers and managers at Conrail. It was about connecting with politicians and it was about connecting with the general public sometimes with Operation Lifesaver. So if I had to pick one photograph of the whole thing, Brock and I, I can see Brock smiling already. We've got a couple pictures <laughs> of this thing. Um, if I had to pick one picture, I think this is, this tells the purpose of that train really well, where you've got 
an excellent photo from Larry DeYoung uh, of Charlie Marshall and Warner Clark that are managers at Conrail connecting and discussing uh, railroad operations. And this is exactly what you see. This view is also really great because this particular car, you've probably seen it in most shots of the OCS. Most of the pictures you get are of the front coming towards you with the ease and the back is, the, off, is uh, the theater car. And that's exactly what this is. And you can see that great little drop off and right down to the tracks. So I start with this because uh, it's important to understand that this isn't just about steel, this is about people. So, uh, so thank you for allowing us to join you guys today. We really appreciate it. Um, just like they did on the Conrail business trains, uh, it's really great to be able to connect with so many people uh, and share our experience about uh, writing this book. Uh, as we go through the presentation, of course, I encourage uh, any kind of questions that you've got come up uh, during, the, during the, the presentation. You can just ask those whenever you want to. I've got Brack on standby. Uh, he's going to be... Uh, pulling up any dates or anything like that. If you throw date questions out, he's got the, a copy of the book, at least in a PDF format, and he'll be uh, looking stuff up for me. So uh, yeah, so before I give you go any further about uh, the office car special and the research equipment that Mike was talking about, before we go any further, I wanna give a chance for you to understand who I am and who Brock is and why we even decided to write a book about this topic. So uh, Brock is uh, seen here in this photograph uh, on the uh, side of 4022. Uh, and I am West Reminder, and uh, I am in the observation room there in that photograph of what was a former Southern Railway office car. Um, and uh, I'd like to think that Stanley Crane was in this very spot. It's very possible, uh, probably actually very likely. But uh, Brock, uh, you can just say hi if you'd like to. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of give a background on uh, myself and why this project came to fruition. Um, I probably saw the OCS for the first time in about the fall of 1997. Um, as I was going to Lebanon Valley College and I had the Harrisburg line uh, literally splitting the campus. And I believe one night I saw a passenger train go by on, on the freight tracks and I saw people inside with, with the cars all lit up and I had no idea what I had just seen. And I, I had to find out what that was. And that, that curiosity is what manifested itself uh, into this book. I spent approximately 15 to 16 years researching, um, gathering artifacts, photographs, uh, any little tidbit I could um, to prepare for this. Uh, as Wes mentioned before, one of the big things in my vision for this book early on was interviews, talking with people, because these trains, they had a personality. It wasn't just the steel. And I wanted to be able to portray that um, in the book. And as Wes and I came together, to work on this book, we both had a great vision that was very similar. Uh, and he's been a joy to work with on this. It's, it's been an absolute privilege to put this together. Uh, and I'm extremely happy that, you know, 416 pages, we probably could have done 500 um, with, with or more with all of the information we had. Um, but a little bit about myself. Um, 2004, the Conrail Historical Society uh, renewed operations. I became member number nine at that time. Uh, I've held many positions throughout the revitalized organization. Um, currently, I am serving as the president. Uh, I also joined the nonprofit Rail Safety D Advocate Operation Lifesaver as a volunteer in 2015. Uh, in 2017, I took over the leadership of Operation Lifesaver of Pennsylvania as their state coordinator. And, you know, obviously those two organizations, this is right up my alley for the, uh, the business train and how they were used. So it, it further cements how much I love um, this subject. And we really went to the ends of the earth to get all of the information 
answer all the questions, uh, any, anything that was out there that wasn't answered previously. We did a lot of research too, uh, to make sure that the facts that we present are correct. Things happen, uh, there are errors that end up in reports. Um, certainly Conrail business car rosters that were handed out year after year uh, ended up having some errors in that we needed to track down and find out, uh, make sure that the information was correct. So um, I'll pass it to Wes, he can describe a little bit about how he got involved in, in the OCS. Yeah, so uh, thanks Brock. So. Um, you know, I, uh, I've always been interested in the OCS training. It's kind of like Brock. I was in an old yard probably when I was in, uh, high school. So probably the early nineties. And I saw out in the distance, these green passenger cars and, uh, they weren't moving. They were just static, but they were sitting there. And I thought, what the heck is that? Like, I, you know, I want to know more. So, uh, it started there. And ever since then, I've just been kind of, uh, I'll, I'll call it, um, obsessed, but in a good way <laughs> with the train. Um, Brock and I met in about 2005, 2007 at a Conroe Historical Society meeting. Um, and we lived in different states at the time. So we kind of parted ways after that meeting and really hadn't talked, honestly, um, for quite a while. But the one thing that was going on in the background without talking to each other is that we were still very much in love with this train. Uh, Brock is much more active on social media. I don't really have much presence at all. Um, so you've probably heard of Brock, but um, I'm famous with about two people uh, for making models of the business car. One of those people that uh, I'm famous with is Brock, so it kind of doesn't really count. But um, yeah, so so we kind of went our separate ways, just didn't get didn't get back in, in contact with each other, and then um, and then we we came together and started making this book. So. The fun, the cool thing about this photograph um, of Brock in on the side of 4022, which is an E8A locomotive, uh, former Erie Lackawanna, is that he is holding in his hand the number boards that were given to him from Bennett Levin. And you can imagine how jealous I was of those and still am, uh, but he's got those in his hands. So that's a pretty cool thing about that picture. The interesting thing about my photograph in the uh, former Southern Observation Lounge area is that this particular car has since been rebuilt by mm -hmm. Norfolk Southern. And there is not one single thing in that photograph that exists outside of there's a roof and there's some walls, but even the windows themselves are all completely changed and gone. So we were able to capture just a little bit of history and I'm really grateful that we were able to do that. So, uh, getting a little bit of backstory, uh, it was, uh, you know, as we were out there doing our separate research and collecting documents, um, one of the things that Brock was doing was getting everything that he could that was related to the office car special. Uh, I was out doing my research. I was trying to get anything that Brock hadn't already got. <laughs> uh, and I didn't do very well because he got most of it. So, um, so I was trying to collect stuff. We were doing our own separate research. I got a message back in 2018 from somebody. And you can see it here on the screen. And it was from somebody named Foxy. And I thought, who the heck is Foxy? <laughs> uh, I had no idea what this message was, but I also didn't realize the information I would get from him later on. So what had happened was I got this message. Uh, the thing that intrigued me the most about this email from this guy named Foxy was obviously the fact that he was the manager of special equipment, which immediately perked my ears right up, although I didn't know that it was called special equipment at the time. But this is the part, and this is the best animation I can do for a PowerPoint, so <laughs> you'll have to forgive me. That's as good as it gets. It said, I have lots of stories. And it was really intriguing and I had to know more. And all the messages that I got from Foxy were about that long and it wasn't enough to get enough information, but I knew then at that point that it was more than just the research about the steel. There was stories behind this. So uh, here's a page from the book uh, off on the uh, left-hand side that some of Brock's stuff that he collected uh, through his years. Uh, while he was collecting those things, which I'm really grateful that he did, 
Uh, on the right hand side, one of the things that I was famous for with maybe like three people back in the early 2000s was writing a website. And it wasn't until after I talked to Foxy or after I had gotten messages from Foxy that I decided, you know, I should probably bring that website back. There seems to be interest in this train on the, on the website or on the internet. People were talking about it. People were asking about it. Um, and so I decided to reboot my website. So in 2020, um, early 2020, during the pandemic, I thought, what better time to sit down and start writing? And I did. So I now have a website at ConroeOCS.com, which as you can see some of the pages off to the right. As I was writing this, I thought to myself, why can't I make this into a book? So I contacted Rudy um, and Rudy and put me back in touch with Brock. And we have really done a really great job of combining efforts uh, to make this come together and to be able to tell the story of the people that ran and operated this train. So some really cool facts about this is that fast forward to now, uh, there is no book yet, by the way, it's still in printing. You can ask Rudy all about his opinion about, about how that's going. We still don't have a book, but it's, it's almost done. At the end of all this, we were able to scan from people's collections and save over two and a half terabytes of photographs from the train uh, and, and of the train. And that's a lot of pictures. If you don't know what two and a half terabytes is, that's a lot of pictures. So we have, we had great uh, contributions to making this book happen that Brock and I don't have all the pictures. So we had great support from people. But here's the thing that was the most interesting. And this is what really changed from when I started writing about these on my website. This is what changed the whole thing. We did over 50 hours, no joke, 50 hours of interviews on the phone with Conrail employees. And we'll talk about who some of those people are. But this very quickly became a book about their stories and not just the steel. It's and Brock employees Hardy. from top, from the CEOs, all the way down to the porters. So top all the way down to the, all the way to the, all the way down. Yeah, it was, it was amazing. And as Brock told you before, we had 416 pages in this book by the time we were done. Uh, Richie, when we were putting this whole presentation together, had emailed me and said, "Are you interested?" And I said, "Well, yeah, I'd like I'll talk about anything that has to do with the office car special." And he said, give me a description of the office car special. And I couldn't give him a description because I was too busy trying to fit more pages in. Uh, at some point, Rudy had to tell me, please, please, could you just stop? <laughs> so we have landed at 416 pages. But again, the thing that this book turned into was, these are the stories of the people that worked and rode this train. This was not just about the steel. And that was the thing that was really cool. And to find photographs from people just like this one. And in this case, you can see the one back in the beginning where we've got you know, the Conrail managers and Conrail 9. We've got employees outside. And you can see the porters in the back there as well. So uh, it's not just about people, though. It is about steel. There's definitely information about steel for those that are interested in steel. Um, this particular photograph is probably one of my favorite pictures of all time. Brock and Rudy are very well aware of that. Uh, I had to make sure that it got its way into the book. It was taken by Joe Jack uh, in Conway Yard uh, with the sun coming up. The train was parked there for the evening for a business dinner on the train and then departed the next day. Uh, an absolutely fantastic photo. And thankfully, Rudy let me put it in the book. So we had to kind of start at the beginning, which is what we did with the book as well. And what we had to do was we had to talk about what is this train for? Uh, as Mike talked about at the beginning, it absolutely is about the track geometry equipment. It's about the office car equipment, and it's about the technical services lab equipment as well. And so we set out to tell people, what is this thing about? Today, everybody has a cell phone, a drone, 
a digital camera. They're out there all the time. You've got the internet to talk about the latest move of the equipment. But back in Conrail's time, there was no internet. There was no cell phones. Uh, so you had to, you did not know what this stuff was. That's why Brock and I back in the nineties were like, what is this? You know, and, and it didn't just come to us. We had to do a lot of research to figure out what it was. But for those that are reading the book, it was important to take a step back to talk about what is this equipment specifically? And Conrail itself did a really good job in the documentation that we have of telling you exactly what it was. And I just, there's no reason for me to tell you what it was. They did a great job of it. And that is that the test cars were testing the condition of their track. They allowed Conrail management to inspect the right-of-way and facilities at the ground level and show customers and potential customers exactly how their freight would move. And I thought that was a really good way to say it. I couldn't say it any better than Conrail did. Um, so that's what they described their special equipment as. I like this photo because off to the side, you can see the business train passing by right next to an 840CW pulling some a, a coal train. So that's a really good example of they're down right where those freight trains were. So Brock mentioned that we got to talk to some people right at the top, and I can't imagine going any higher than talking to Jim Hagen. Uh, Jim Hagen was the second to last uh, CEO for Conrail. Um, we reached out to him and said, we would like to get your take on the business trade. Um, and he agreed. I was surprised. <laughs> I was quite happy. Uh, and we got a chance to talk to him. And one of the things that he said was, the way that he would use the train was to go out on sales and marketing trips and to hit major towns and customers where they were located, give them a ride on the train to see where it went and how it worked, and then have dinner on that train. So um, it was used by Jim and all the other CEOs. How much it was used depended on the CEO, right? So the very first CEO was in a different situation, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit. But L. Stanley Crane, as you mentioned, Mike, absolutely enjoyed and loved seeing the railroad from the business train. Jim Hagen, on the other hand, uh, and it's in the book, and I, I, I hope it's okay to have quoted him like this. He did approve it. Called himself just too cheap to use it. Uh, he, he had a hard time with spending the money to use the equipment, but he allowed others to use it. And I think the same thing would be said for David Levan. So really it depended on those CEOs, but capturing um, Jim Hagen's story, and it's not just about the OCS train, it's also about the startup of Conrail in the book, was hugely uh, impressive and we were really glad to have him. One of the great things about this photograph is uh, that it was the last board of directors trip. I mean, it happened on June 16th of 1998. Um, Jim Hagen is in the uh, multicolored shirt there next to the chef. The chef there is named Michael Kennedy. He was the executive chef um, at, uh, for the train specifically. That was his job. His job was to cooked for the train and anybody that was on it and every single person of all 50 hours, I don't think that anybody rode that train didn't compliment the food. Everybody complimented the food. And you can thank uh, Michael Kennedy towards the end. Before that was another gentleman named, um, um, named what? Ted Nelson, Ted Nelson. Uh, off to the other side uh, of the picture, you'll see on the left, you'll see a gentleman wearing a hat and he's got lots of pins on his hat. So a lot of these trips, uh, they would make a pin specifically for that trip or a sticker. And those things ended up on a lot of the, the crew's hats. They collected them. They were pretty cool little collection things. This gentleman's name is Larry Lester and he was a car attendant on the train. So really great experience being able to talk to someone at the very top. His interview in the book is incredibly interesting to get his take on not just the OCS train, but the startup of Conrail in general. But the track measurement train uh, that Mike was talking about at the beginning of the meeting um, also had its own purpose. And it, I thought that it was good to just call this out as well because they had their own 
purpose separate from what Conrail um, said, a little more detail. The purpose of the track, track geometry train was to, uh, they actually call it the track measurement train, was to collect track geometry in railware data over the entire system. Uh, and what that would be used for was maintenance planning and rail replacement. These cars, as they went down the track, remember this, there was no GPS. Um, you see that little uh, bay window on the side of those cars. Those were for cameras. The other car that they had, which was a rail analyzer car, car 22 had bay windows as well. And the reason they had bay windows was because someone was actually sitting and looking out the bay window for milepost data so they could mark it on the map of where they were. So we're talking a different era of track geometry and how they did stuff, but it was leading, absolutely um, led the way in terms of their track geometry. So those are the two purposes um, that we have of the train. We go into a lot more detail about those. We also talk about the different types of trains that ran. So uh, what was the difference between a sales and marketing trip down to uh, you know, perhaps an operation lifesaver train. So we do go into a lot of detail about those trains. And, and when Stanley Crane came onto the railroad, he asked about Conrail's geometry train and they're like, well, we don't have one. So he's like, well, we're gonna fix that right away. So uh, the product that you saw there was 100% uh, mandated directly from him that, hey, we need a geometry car. Um, and we show you tons of photographs of the car being built. Um, it, it's absolutely amazing to see the equipment that goes into it. Um, but there's, there's a beginning to end on that. But like Mike mentioned at the opening, uh, Stanley Crane immediately when he came from the Southern, he's like, where's your geometry train? Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. So, okay. So now that we know what the train is, you know, what it was used for in general, the next thing we go into in the book is just to talk about the eras. And we broke, you know, Brock and I just kind of picked our own eras about how we would break up and talk about the train. Um, the first era that we talked about was the early era. I, I think we can call it, maybe we can call it the blue era, I guess. Uh, it's, it's, the, it's the train from April of 76 up to 1981. So uh, this absolutely fantastic photograph uh, was of the 4022, which was assigned to the business train on Conrail. This was um, at the Harrisburg diesel shop, which uh, is where the engine was uh, assigned to for maintenance. I don't know if you could say it was kept there all the time. I think it was out in the move lot, but it was assigned to there for maintenance. And we do have photos of it in the uh, actual roundhouse itself. Uh, after the Harrisburg uh, diesel shop closed down, it was transferred over to Enola in uh, 1982. But this was the first engine. This was, this is where it all started. This is Brock's baby. Brock uh, loves the 4022. Uh, this is where it all started with this uh, blue engine right here. Their roster on day one was pretty short. Uh, it was uh, not, not a super long roster of equipment. Now, there were, and we do have photographs of other business cars from other predecessor railroads that were at Reading shops right after the split, but they were not used, at least continued to be used in official capacity. So when we think about the early passenger ro roster, we're th talking about these cars because these are the cars that got painted blue and you would see out on the road. Uh, interesting thing about this roster is that these are all Penn Central cars with the one exception being the Erie Lackawanna uh, had a, a lightweight sleeper car, which is a 10-5 sleeper. So they had a sleeper car uh, and the rest of these were Penn Central cars. The other interesting thing is that all of these uh, business cars, numbered one, two, three, four, and 10, were all heavyweight cars with observation platforms on the end. So they had a bunch of, of heavyweight observations. Uh, they had a sleeper and then Conrail 20, which was a research car for the technical services laboratory was based out of Cleveland, Ohio. So you can see again, that this was a very small roster at the very beginning. And that wouldn't change until L. Stanley Crane came around. Um, 
Paint schemes for these were exactly what you probably remember from the early years. They were Conrail blue and they had black roofs on the equipment and they had uh, black underbodies as well, so black trucks. But you can see things are starting kind of small. Love this photograph. Uh, this is taken in South Amboy, New Jersey uh, on June 5th, 1980. Uh, what I like about it is the fact there are two um, uh, New Jersey Department of Transportation E8s still in Southern paint uh, off to the side and one directly behind the Conrail 4022. So the Conrail 4022 wasn't just being used strictly for business train service. It actually, at the beginning, was pulling uh, New Jersey Department of Transportation commuter trains. It would also help out on Amtrak trains. Um, it was assigned to a couple times, at least, that we know of. I'm sure there's others, but what we know of right now is the Broadway Limited, and the National Limited. You can see this engine all over the place. Uh, could be a testament to the fact that the business train didn't get a ton of use at the beginning. Uh, Later on, these engines, uh, the E8s that Conrail had, did not pull Amtrak trains or commuter trains anymore. They were assigned and dedicated to just this train. And at the beginning, that wasn't necessarily the case. Another photograph um, from Joe Jack in uh, Conway Yard. Not only do the cars date it, but the paint scheme dates it as well. So one of the interesting things about 4022 uh, you can see the horn up there. Uh, it had a couple different horn, horns and different horn placement on the engine. Uh, this is what it started out as. And you can see that the black roof there extends down around the windows and onto the nose. Interestingly enough, that same uh, application of black paint on the nose eventually made its way to the uh, diesel power on Conrail's uh, system. But before this picture was taken, if you did any kind of research or buy the book and take a look at the photos in there, what you'll see is the 4022 uh, had black paint applied to just the roof, not to the nose and to the windows, twice in 1977. And we were able to track that information down. It looks dirty, but the reality is the paint just came right off. So twice in 1977, it had a black roof, uh, paint came off each time, and then here you see it again, where it's got a full black paint, but this time covering the nose and the windows. The office cars, so that's the E8 uh, moving around the system wherever it needed to be. The office cars, this was uh, not uncommon to see Conrail's office cars behind a trailer train. So in this particular case, you can see this one. This is from August of 1977, so not too long after uh, Conrail started. You can see a trailer train. Interesting thing about this is you've got a uh, perishable foods box car right behind the trail vans or behind the uh, trailers. Uh, and you can just barely make out this photos, but you can see that the lounge is actually full of uh, Conrail managers as well. This practice of putting the business cars behind the trailer train like this was fairly common. And uh, that actually lasted up, not just the beginning, but into the 80s as well. Uh, Foxy uh, talked a lot about uh, traveling on the back of these cars, in fact, all the way over to the West Coast. So Foxy has had the opportunity to travel on these, uh, on the back of a trailer train across the country. So that gives you an idea of these, this equipment didn't always stick together. It was uh, kind of scattered at the early years. These two guys, uh, so these are both uh, New York Central. They went to Penn Central. Um, and then they became Conrail 1 and Conrail 4. In the book, we refer to them as Conrail 1 first and Conrail 4 first because later on these cars were sold and two Southern cars were purchased and they were also named Conrail 1, which we called second and Conrail 4, which we called second. So we had a little bit of a confusion in terms of You've got two cars at two different times with both carrying numbers one and four. This photo is taken uh, at the Reading shops in Pennsylvania. Um, and the cool thing to think about here is that Conrail One was assigned to Edward G. Jordan, uh, which was the first 
CEO of Conrail. So that was his car to use. Um, and he didn't use it much. It sat there a lot. Um, and the reason for that was because, and when we were talking to Jim Hagen about this, he gave us a, the perfect explanation for it. Conrail was losing a million dollars a day. Um, they did not have a bunch of money to be going out and running around in office cars. What uh, Mr. Hagen told us directly was that it was hard for Edward Jordan to get behind the idea that they were going to take these cars out with cooks, waiters, and car attendants to go look at the railroad. So what we found out was that what they did instead was they high railed. They would take a high rail truck, they would visit a piece of uh, an area of the system, and they would go to a hotel for the night. They didn't sleep on these cars and they would come back to the corporate headquarters or to wherever their, their location was. So these cars were not used all that super much. And it makes sense. Uh, Jim Hagen also told us that, you know, the USRA was watching them. And they said, if you spend too much money, it's going to end up in the newspaper. And the last thing that Conrail wanted to do right when it got started was to look extravagant and talk about how much money they were spending on things like this. So these cars sat here unused for quite a while. Uh, love this photo again. Uh, you can see a couple different generations of equipment. You see uh, Amtrak phase one back there, you see Penn Central and you see a little bit of Conrail in the front. Um, so the equipment, the office cars themselves, even though that picture was taken at Reading, they did, they did make their way to Reading, but more times than not, they were spread around the system. So it was common to see the office cars uh, at 30th Street Station in Philadelphia, which is what you see here. It was also common to see Conrail 3 down in Washington, D.C. for political use. And it was common to see uh, office car one out in Chicago as well. So they would be all over the system and they were not kept in one spot. And that was the same for the E8. So keep in mind that early era, you could find this stuff uh, pretty much everywhere, scattered everywhere. Now Conrail 3 um, is a former Michigan Central car. It went to the New York Central after that, and it, then it went to the Penn Central. Um, now Brock and I had a really fun time tracking down numbers and making sure that they were accurate because the Penn Central, if you don't know this, changed their office car numbers all the time. It would go from Penn Central three to four, back to five, then to six. And sometimes there were rumors that it was numbered seven, but we couldn't find anything about seven. So we had a really hard time tracking down these Penn Central numbers. But this guy in particular was really interesting. This one has uh, uh, an interesting history in that this particular car was just like the rest of the equipment on Conrail at the beginning of Conrail. What do I mean by that? I mean, track, rail cars, passenger cars, engines, they all needed um, work. They were in rough shape. And Conrail 3 here is absolutely no different than anything else. So this particular car ended up at the Reading shops and it was having electrical problems. Uh, and the lights would flicker on it when it was going down the, uh, the rails. It's much like an HO scale train set. You know, your lights are flickering. Well, that was what was actually happening in this particular car. So as it goes down the rails, the lights are flickering. They take it into the Reading shops and the executives at Conrail said, fix it, right? So the Reading shops, which are perfectly capable and equipped to fix this, start working. They were called not that long afterwards and they said, stop working on it, we're not gonna fix it. Bill Koff, who was an electrician at the Reading Shops, remembers this and actually worked on it and we've got his story in the book and he goes into a little more detail. I'll give you a little summary though. They start it, they stop it, they start it, they stop it. Uh, at one point, the executives called up to the Reading Shops and said, um, go ahead and fix it. When they went to fix it this time, they said, if you tell us to fix it again, we're going to cut all the wires so that you have no choice but to fix it. And that's exactly what happened. The electricians 
uh, went into Conrail 3, they started ripping out the wires and they literally started cutting everything so that if they were to get a call again to stop working, they would have no choice but to finish the job. And that and call came. That's that? And that call came to then stop, but it was too late at that point. That's exactly right. The call came from the Conrail executive, stop, we're not going to fix the car, it's too much money. By that point, it was too late. The Reading shops did an absolutely fantastic job of completely rewiring this car from end to end. And the cool thing is that car that lasted on Conrail all the way to 1999, went to CSX and is now in private ownership and has not had to be completely rewired since. So the Reading shops were absolutely fantastic at what they did. The other interesting thing about this photograph is that this is taken in Amtrak's 30th Street station. Well, Amtrak, just like Conrail, needed money, right? Uh, they needed money. They needed to generate money. And one of the ways they could do that was to charge more money for Conrail to park their cars right there. So you've got all these things going on where the equipment is spread across the system. You're getting charged to store them in places. And so uh, that was the end of what we called the early era. Recapping again, so just like everything else on Conrail in 1976, stuff needed attention and the office cars were absolutely not exempt from that. They needed work. The railroad was losing money. Uh, Jim Higgins, the guy that said, we're losing a million dollars a day. Um, so they didn't use the equipment all that much. Those two uh, passenger cars I showed you earlier, the Conrail 1 and Conrail 4, that were at the Reading shops were sold and they were sold into private ownership. One of them is actually, they're actually both very famous. And I think they've actually just joined up recently on a private car charter, but those two cars were sold by Conrail pretty early in the 1980s. But as Mike said earlier, here's the biggest change that started. And I, and I know that he had a bigger change on just Conrail, but I'm gonna focus in on his change in terms of the business and research fleet which is that L. Stanley Crane comes to Conrail on January 1st, 1981 and becomes president. He came from the Southern. So things start to change for Conrail. But again, like I said, we're gonna focus on the business train and the research train. So L. Stanley Crane is now in charge. He says, let's move all of this equipment under one roof and one spot. So all of the equipment, uh, you'll have to apologize, I apologize for the noise behind me. Because I live in downtown Lancaster, you'd think that that was all Amish. It's not, <laughs> it's pretty loud down here. Um, so all of this equipment now for the first time under Stanley Crane is now gathered at Reading, Pennsylvania shops. Now they used to stay here sometimes and they would go here to get fixed, but now this shop is dedicated to the maintenance of these cars, which is a big shift. Uh, this building, interestingly enough, is still there. It looks just like that today. The only difference is that there are no more rails coming out of the front, but the tracks inside the building are still there. Brock and I got to go and imagine better days for the shop, but it's all still there. In fact, those numbers for each track, one, two, three, and four are still there. So pretty cool to see, for us at least. But that was the first change. So now all these passenger cars are being gathered up at Reading. The next change, let's go back to this guy here. My, I told you about earlier that he reached out to me. His name was, was uh, Foxy. And I couldn't figure out like, who is Foxy? Uh, later on, getting a chance to talk to Foxy on the phone, I said, but what's your name? <laughs> like. What do you want me to call you? He said, it's Foxy. So I was like, but what, is that what you want me to use? He's like, my name's Foxy. That's what everybody knows. Everybody at Connery on name is Foxy. And that's what I am. His real name is actually UL Foxy, Ulyss Fox, but everybody knew him on Conrail as Foxy. This is probably the only photograph that I have. He has no photographs of himself uh, at uh, Conrail Times, but this is the only photograph that we have of Foxy. Now, Foxy, uh, after Stanley Crane came around, became the manager of special equipment. 
which basically meant he was responsible for these cars every single time they moved in every single place that they went foxy was on those cars the other big thing that happened was a gentleman named john evans also was hired at the Reading shops and he became the general superintendent of the Reading shops so he was responsible for not just the office cars but the maintenance away fleet that was also maintained in Reading during that time foxy ended up having a really great relationship with Stanley Crane and spoke very highly of Mr. Crane. And he also spoke very high, highly of Richard Hasselman or Dick Hasselman as well. One thing you'll see about this picture is now the cars are green. So the last picture we showed you back in the early era, all of a sudden this equipment has turned green. Love this photograph, extremely rare. L. Stanley Crane, you've probably heard the story. It is true, confirmed by many Conrail employees that heard him say it, um, did not like Conrail Blue business cars. He thought they were harsh. He was not a big fan of these cars, uh, that color anyway. He also didn't like Conrail Blue on locomotives, but he could not afford to repaint the entire fleet. That would not have been a good idea. But what he could do is paint these things in green. And they're very, very similar to Southern Railway. And there's no, that is on purpose. So this particular picture was on the way back to Reading in Harrisburg from its very first trip. And it's priceless because the nose of the 4022 has no Conrail logo on or lettering on it at all. It's just blank. And that lasted not too long. It got lettering. And from that time on to the end of Conrail, it always had its nose lettering. So this was a very rare photograph taken in Harrisburg um, by Chip Sign. All right, I've heard this debate over and over and I've seen it in forums. I've seen it in model railroad forums. I've seen it on train owners. I've seen it just about anywhere anybody ever talks about the equipment. It's black, right? No, it's green. It's Pullman green, right? No, it's Brunswick green. What color is this train? Well, I can tell you firsthand from the person that was told to paint the equipment by L. Stanley Crane that it was green and Conrail had their own name for it and it was called Conrail Pullman Green. That's the official color. From here on out on the internet, hopefully it'll be fixed. It is Conrail Pullman Green. The question was always this. Well, it was green, but it had black trucks. Well, it was green, but it had black underbody equipment. This picture here shows you, nope, the equipment was painted green from the very top of the roof to the very bottom of the trucks, including all of the equipment underneath. And Conrail green, Conrail Pullman green is different than other Pullman greens. It was its own color. Um, we have the actual paint codes used for it um, and even the index within the Conrail um, inventory uh, of all their materials to, you know, to show that it was its own named color, very separate. So not Brunswick, not Pullman Green, but Conrail Pullman Green. Conrail Pullman Green, that's right. And the funny thing is this. So during our research of writing the book, I had confirmation from lots of people that worked on the equipment. I had confirmation from the guy that was responsible for the equipment, Foxy, and Carl Kennedy, who was later responsible for it. And I still didn't take them at their word. I said, I want the Conrail parts catalog that tells me exactly what color and code it is. And I got it. <laughs> uh, Eric Levin sent me uh, about a dozen books with all the part numbers for everything Conrail. And one of them, sure enough, it's listed as Conrail Pullman Green. We have that part number in the book, which I think is pretty neat. So hopefully, this solves the mystery of, is it green, black, Pullman green, Brunswick green? It was none of those. It was its own color called Conrail Pullman green, top to bottom. The only exception to this was the track geometry train, which did have silver roofs. And the reason the track geometry train had silver roofs was there was two things. One, for heat. Um, so... They, you know, the air conditioners on those cars were underneath the cars, which means the heat goes up to the top. So it would make the cars warmer as it was. The silver just helped that reflect that, that, that the sunlight right off of it. 
The second reason, and I might not be saying this correctly, the way I've been saying it always is something called alum elastic. And alum elastic was applied to the top of those cars to prevent leaks and water leaks in those cars. There was one time in the early 1990s, I think it was 92 or 93, where those roofs were no longer silver, they were green again. It was green for one year. And the guy that was in charge of the, the track geometry train uh, was convinced by Carl Kennedy, who was in charge of the business cars, to paint them green. He said, paint them green, it will match everything else. So they did. And it what didn't take too long for them to have a water leak within the geometry car, which you can imagine is not a good idea. Uh, the water was coming down through, started leaking through the roof, molding up the carpets, and they had to do a whole lot of work. From that point on, they went back to silver, and they were alum elastic uh, coated from there from there on out. So that's the that's the true color. Uh, that's the true story of the colors. Believe it or not. Um, now, having 2.5 terabytes worth of photographs of this train, did it look black sometimes? Absolutely. Did it look uh, you know, dirty and uh, maybe brown down the bottom. Absolutely. There's no question about it. It was a really hard color to capture on film. Uh, and you can see that in the variations of the different colors depended on the day. Uh, Brock and I also have chips of paint off of the cars uh, in green. So I can tell you for sure, definitely green. We also have a Pantone match um, for the color that's listed in the book. So um, if you're looking for that, that's also in the book. Yep, absolutely. Okay, back to Stanley, Stanley Crane. So L. Stanley Crane wanted no more blue office cars. Well, he got it. He got, he got Conrail Pullman green office cars. Um, but he also had a preference to view his railroad from these office cars. He did it on Southern, and he wanted to do it on Conrail, and he did. One of the things that he did was we got rid of Conrail one and four from New York Central history or from their uh, predecessor line. And he bought his own cars back from the Southern. He bought them for Conrail. Now I don't say he, he had Conrail buy them of course, but they were purchased in the early 1980s um, for his use and he used them. And from his direction, Conrail managers started using them as well. So they got used. Most people think that the office cars went to Reading to stay there so that they didn't get dirty and they didn't rust out in the snow. And actually that's not entirely true because Reading was there to allow the crews to work in a heated and covered location all in one spot. And that was the purpose for keeping them in one spot in that building because this equipment was used year round. It was used through the snow and we have pictures of the equipment out in the snow. We also have, we're able to track down how many office car specials were run uh, during certain years in the eighties. And so we can see from documentation that this, these things did not, they were not babied like they sat in a, in a hangar and they weren't used. They were used all the time. So this particular photo is taken at the Reading shops uh, and it was taken in May of 1983. This is one of L. Stanley Crane's business cars from the Southern Railway. Southern Railway uh, built many office cars uh, and they were all very similar to this. When this car arrived at Conrail, uh, you can see that it's being uh, switched into the shops by a Penn Central GP38-2. And it did not stay in Southern paint for long. It was, paint, it was repainted almost almost immediately into Conrail Pullman green paint. So it did not look like this, but this is how it arrived on Conrail. And it was, you were starting to see things change with the office car fleet by keeping them in Reading, hiring new people to take care of the stuff and then the purchase and acquisition of new equipment. We talked about uh, the title of this page of this, this chapter being called the build era. And you may be wondering why is it called the build era? And I think this picture does a pretty good job of explaining why it was called the build era. And the reason it was called the build era is because they purchased and uh, modified many, many, many passenger cars for their office car fleet. Most of the work for most of their cars was done at the Reading passenger shops. 
by Conrail employees themselves. There was one exception to that, and that was the photo that you see here. So this picture uh, is the track geometry car, which was numbered 21. Uh, Conrail purchased a Santa Fe office car, and they sent it directly to Beach Grove shops. And the Amtrak was Amtrak was um, uh, was uh, hired basically to to convert this car into a track geometry car. So Amtrak Beach Grove shops actually made this. Now, uh, finding pictures of the actual build from the 80s. We're not talking about cell phone time now. Let's just keep that in mind. You don't have a thousand pictures on your cell phone of the building of these cars. You have um, very few photographs of these cars being built. And we were able to get our hands on a lot of photographs of these things being built. And we have uh, a lot of them in the book. We could probably do another book on just these and the build of it because we have enough photos to do that. Interestingly enough, there was a gentleman that works at Norfolk Southern who wishes to remain anonymous, found out I was doing the book and reached out to me and said, um, hey, you know, I've got a, I've got a drawer full of these old photos from Conrail back when they built this stuff. You want it? <laughs> His manager approved it. He sent it over and we literally now have just, I, I can't, I don't know how many, uh, many, many photographs of the build. But this particular photo uh, is telling for a lot of different things. It speaks to what Mike said at the beginning, which is they were leading the way in technology. This stuff looks really old to us, but when they were building this, this was top of the line. This was custom built uh, a lot. Some of the equipment actually came, was built in Australia. Uh, it came over. There's a lot of equipment that was top of the line for Conrail and for the railroad industry at the time. This photo shows uh, the car in progress. This is standing from the uh, observation end of 21, looking uh, towards the front of the car. And this would, these are the equipment racks that you would see. The gentlemen standing behind these equipment racks are what are standing in what would become the clean room for those cars and that clean room stayed up through Norfolk Southern. So this is the equipment that was that was uh, housed in that uh, car. And some of the equipment wasn't even anywhere else. It hadn't been invented. You know, Mike talked Correct. about how instrumental Conroe was in, in being a leader in the industry. So things such as a hot box simulator, they were developed and invented by Conrail, patented by Conrail, yep. and sold to other railroads because previous to that, there was nothing like that. And they developed two different kinds of just the hot box um, simulators. There were many other pieces like that that were created by Conrail to better their track and, and their their understanding of the geometry of their of their railroad. Right. And we got to talk to the people that were involved with and took these photographs. So we, we were able to interview them and get their story into the book about why things happened, what happened, the technical services laboratory that had been housed in Cleveland, which was eventually moved to the uh, Altoona shops. Um, they were responsible for the development of a lot of this hot, like the hot box equipment. The, these guys that worked in these uh, in the technical services lab were incredible. And they worked hand in hand with any issues that came up with the office cars and definitely with the track measurement stuff. So we have pictures of the technical services laboratory performing ride quality tests using the dining room table of Conrail 3 as their station to house all the equipment. And they, so they worked with all these different pieces, but the technical services lab was absolutely incredible. And we'll talk a little more about that and what kind of detail we go into in the book about that. So you can see back to what, uh, you know, Mike said at the beginning, they did not have a track geometry cars. Stanley Crane was shocked. Uh, they almost had two track geometry cars um, and they figured out a way to keep it running all the time. And so they said, if we can keep it running, there's no reason to build another one. So they had just this one uh, specifically for track geometry. So this is car 21. This is in 1985 and you can see it pretty fresh out of the shops uh, with its silver roof covered in aluminum elastic. This uh, equipment was frequently paired with 1933. 
uh, the gentleman that was in charge of the track geometry equipment said it was kind of assigned to the track geometry cars. It wasn't necessarily signed. They did everything that they could, including deferring maintenance and emptying toilets to keep that engine with the train as much as possible. But he stopped just short of saying it was assigned to this equipment. Although you can find rosters that say that it was. Well, of course, the most famous things and the things that you see most often photographed would be the E8As. And um, obviously they were beautiful engines, at least in my opinion. Um, and we were able to find photographs of all of the four Conrail switchers that were traded to Amtrak for the 4020 and the 4021, which is what you see here. The 4020, the 4021 were the most used engines. They became the primary engines for the office car fleet. They, after they were completed and they were sent to the Junior Locomotive Shop, Conrail crews overhauled them. They came with HEP power. And so that set off in motion the conversion of the rest of the passenger equipment to 480 volts to be compatible with Amtrak uh, and with their new E8s. So that kicked off a lot of uh, upgrades and improvements to the office car fleet. Now, if you remember me early, earlier saying that the 4022 lived in Harrisburg, or was at least assigned to Harrisburg, um, stayed at the uh, diesel terminal there. After that was closed, it moved to Enola. There was a building in Enola that was called the Greenhouse. Is that right? That's right, Brock, right? The Greenhouse? Still there today. Still there today. It was called the greenhouse because it was green. <laughs> um, that is where the 4022 lived. Once they finished the 4020, that joined the 4022 in Enola. So the two of them lived in the greenhouse up until the time that the 4021 was finished. And then the 4020, the 4021 lived in Enola and the former Erie Lackawanna 4022 was then moved to Reading and it stayed uh, the rest of the time uh, at the Reading shops. But obviously a pretty good, good trade for them. We have photographs of what happened to these engines and what kind of service they went into for Amtrak. We've got an absolutely fantastic photograph of those engines working for Amtrak. So the build era, was hugely influential over the, the uh, Conrail special equipment fleet during that time. This is when it really got to its peak. Um, there were, uh, at the beginning, all the passenger equipment is now maintained at Reading. It was overseen by Foxy and John Evans. Thankfully, John Evans, uh, Foxy kept absolutely nothing from his career on Conrail. John Evans kept everything from his career on, on Conrail. And a lot of the documentation that we have uh, in regards to how many feet of wire were in Conrail 9, we do have that information, uh, came from John Evans. Conrail built at their Reading shops, the theater car, number nine. They built uh, a bedroom car, number eight, an eight bedroom uh, car. They built the rail analyzer car in, in uh, collaboration with the technical services lab. And everything was converted to 480 volts HEP. Stanley Crane, being the Southern guy that he was, ended up purchasing five different pieces of Southern railway equipment, including two office cars, which were numbered Conrail 1 and Conrail 4. And he also purchased three different coaches. One of those coaches was used to be converted to bedroom car number eight, and the other two stayed as coaches. They also bought a lot of other passenger cars. If you were around during that time and you were up at Reading, uh, apparently you could see all kinds of stuff from all kinds of railroads. We have pictures of that from Conrail employees that you'd go up there and all of a sudden there'd be something new. Um, so they collected a lot of passenger cars. Rumor has it that some of that equipment was going to be overhauled for uh, excursion service. After that fell through, all of the extra equipment was sold off. 
but they did buy Conrail uh, 55, which is the full length dome car, very popular car amongst everyone that rode the train, very popular car amongst those that were trackside to see this former Santa Fe full length dome over on the, the, uh, the East Coast. So they purchased that. They built their geometry train. They went from nothing to the geometry car, 21, the rail analyzer car, 22. And they also had a support car that they uh, modified. It was an old baggage car and they had that. So they now have a proper geometry train in service. They swapped out their switchers for the Amtrak E8s that became the 4020 and the 4021. And uh, most significantly, L. Stanley Crane has resigned during this time as well. And Richard Sanborn uh, joins Conrail in early 1988 and was set to become president in 1989. Richard Sanborn was uh, hugely into the use of office cars as well, just like Stanley Crane was. One of the first things that he did when he got to Conrail was to go shopping for a new business car, office car that he could call his own. He found it in the form of a former Norfolk Southern, Norfolk uh, Western office car and converted that to Conrail 100. Interestingly enough, that same car is the car that carried him his uh, casket to Boston on a funeral train. Foxy was on that train when uh, the uh, train departed and, and carried that all the way up to Boston. So his untimely death, he was not president for very long. And after that time, Jim Hagan has succeeded him and is now CEO. So lots and lots of stuff. Where the office car special got to, where the track geometry stuff got to, it happened during this period, which is why we decided to call it the build era. And it wouldn't stay that way. So they had all this equipment, they had all these, all this stuff was, was built. It didn't change much after Reading. In fact, uh, in 1991, after they closed the Reading shops, uh, they moved everything to miscellaneous too. I've asked lots of people, why did they close Reading? They did a great job. They did do a great job, but they closed the shops down. They didn't need it. They moved all their, all the equipment to Holidaysburg to be fixed. And everything that went to uh, all, the, all the passenger equipment went to miscellaneous two in Altoona. So the good thing about this was that all of the equipment for the first time was now together. Before, remember, the E8s lived in NOLA uh, and the cars were over in Reading. Uh, now everything's under one roof. And miscellaneous two is a monster of a building. It was enough room to house everything. Um, so another big change that came along was, uh, Foxy went, and this is a great story. I'm not going to tell you it because I think you should read the book about it, but let me just, I'll give you a little hint. Foxy lost a card game on the business cars, uh, with someone you may recognize the name of Donald Swanson. It was after that card game that, uh, Foxy uh, no longer worked on the office car special, but instead now worked in Selkirk at the diesel terminal and actually ended his career on Conrail uh, at Conway Yard. So to replace Foxy uh, was Carl Kennedy. And Carl Kennedy uh, performed, had a slightly different title, but basically performed the same duties as before that Foxy did, which was he was responsible for the passenger equipment and anywhere and everywhere that the train went Carl Kennedy was on it. At the Miscellaneous 2 shop, Carl remembers about 14 people that were assigned to work with him at Miscellaneous 2, which included foremans, electricians, pipe fitters, carmen, and yes, an upholsterer. Uh, why an upholsterer? We'll talk about that in a little bit, but they actually had an upholsterer as well. So, so uh, Carl Kennedy was now in charge of the equipment based out of Altoona. The other thing that was starting to happen was Donald Swanson, who had been the vice, senior vice president of operations, um, used to use CAR2 a lot. Again, I always stop short of saying that it was assigned to Donald Swanson. Richard Hasselman loved Conrail 10, 
um, an observation car, but they weren't typically assigned to them. They just used them pretty heavily whenever they went out. Conrail 2, which was a, uh, a former New York Central car, uh, Penn Central car, was one of those cars that uh, he used all the time. After Donald Swanson retired, though, Conrail 2 um, basically was unused. Uh, and at that time, the Technical Services Laboratory, which prior to this had Conrail 20, an old car member from the original roster, um, they now had this car. They converted it for their use. So they went from this old rickety uh, passenger car that they outfitted with equipment racks. Brock and I got to see it uh, last summer, uh, the inside, which was pretty great. Um, they went from that to having an actual office car, uh, which meant they could take slightly longer showers. Uh, they had their own nice bedrooms and they had kitchens and all kinds of stuff inside this car. So they were a little bit spoiled with the use of Conrail 2. And it was converted by the miscellaneous shops in Altoona to Conrail 19. And this is the process that you see right here where it's jacked up, getting ready to undergo its conversion for the technical services lab as Conrail 19. Oh, by the way, I don't know if you can tell from the picture, but this is towards the end of the shop and all you can see are these lights that just go straight down the shop. It's just a long cavernous building with lots of, lots of room for the cars to live. So the track geometry car train was uh, based here in Altoona. Uh, it was, uh, uh, that's where it ended up most of the time. You can see the uh, uh, almost officially assigned 1933 B237 locomotive attached to those cars. There was one thing that Brock and I uh, were not able to figure out, and uh, it drives us crazy to this day. And that is there's one particular car that is behind this B2, B237 that was uh, a former military hospital car. And Conrail had purchased it in the 80s when they were buying a bunch of other cars. It was in Reading originally and made its way over to the miscellaneous two shop. Uh, it was converted for use on the geometry car, uh, the geometry train. And what it served was storage. Uh, because every time the track geometry car went over a spot that needed to be fixed immediately, it would actually spray out a yellow paint in the area of where that defect was, um, much to the dismay of the maintenance of way crews, I'm sure. But this car eluded us. We have not been able to do a good job of tracking down its history. If you know something, let us know. We're going to post uh, errors. There aren't any errors. I'm sure there's no errors in the book, but if there are, um, we'll post them on my website at conroeocs.com. Brock and I are going to be working on revamping that and making it our site together and we'll post uh, any errors. And if you have information about 24, we'll definitely uh, post that there as well. And I'll say, I mean, we worked with the railroads, we worked with the AAR, we worked with FRA. Uh, we certainly found out more information about car 24 than had ever been discovered previously, but there's still just one or two mysteries of what happened between this time period. Because for, for this book, we go from beginning to present day on all of these cars and engines. Um, I took a 7,000 mile nine day trip at the end of May to go see um, six of the former cars to get present day photos of uh, the configuration and where they are now today. So uh, the, the back half of the book, the, the amount of detail on all of this information you're gonna get from the day they were built um, to I think the last photograph that's in the book was taken um, towards the end of July um, as, as a car um, had just recently received a fresh paint job, literally being finished hours earlier. Yep, that's right. So that takes us to the end of our era. There's a lot more detail. I mean, tons more detail that I'm going to be able to go into tonight. I could talk for three hours. I won't. I promise we're getting close to the end here. But this picture I love. Uh, it's, uh, you know, Conrail kind of drifting off to the sunset. You can see 
all the the uh, the sheeting on Conrail Nine that they built. And uh, I asked Foxy about it. He got a little testy and said, like, it's thinner sheeting. Like it, you know, it's not as thick as the heavyweight cars were. Of course, it looks like that. So I'm sure he caught some flank for that at some point. But the reality is, is that these cars and this train was used heavily in the '90s and in the late '80s, um, and it served its purpose really well. We um, go into the detail that Brock describes about each of these cars. There's lots of great stories in there, but you can tell um, just from me talking that there wasn't too much that happened in Altoona during those years. The equipment was there. They had what they needed. There was always talks about possibly buying one or two other office cars, but they didn't need to is the reality. They had what they needed. By the time it got close to the merger, that all bets were off anyway. So they weren't going to be doing and buying and, and overhauling any cars. But what they did do during these years where they moved everything to Altoona for the first time. So now the technical services lab, the track measurement train and the office cars and all the E8s now live in one spot. It was overseen by Carl Kennedy, which performed essentially the same role as Foxy did. Uh, they converted office car two, which was again, uh, unofficially assigned to Donald Swanson to test car number 19. And they made lots of various interior upgrades on the final years of Conrail. So that was the first section of the book. We go into a lot more detail. We also go into the histories of the cars pretty deep uh, so that you can get a sense for where they came from and where they ended up. So we have information in this equipment history section about four engines, which are the three E's and the B237. We talk about 22 of the cars. There are other cars that showed up and you could see, you know, moving around the system that were passenger cars for Conrail, but we're talking about the 22 cars that were actually assigned to official service. And amazingly, we have 36 different diagrams uh, showing you all the different types of uh, things, everything you probably didn't want to know about these cars you can have uh, in this book. So this kind of shows you uh, an example of the histories. We go from the very beginning, like I said, we talk about the dates, we talk about its Amtrak number, we talk about where it came from, how it got there, how thick the walls were. We know how thick the metal wood walls were. We know this stuff. So, and then you can see on the flip side where it ended up. So we tried to put most of our emphasis on Conrail, not necessarily the predecessors and, not, and definitely not Norfolk Southern and CSX. We wanted to at least capture where they are today. So we did that as well. Now, I'm gonna talk a little bit, and I'll keep this short, Rudy, I promise, about Conrail 1. Um, this is my favorite car. I could have written a book just about this car. Um, I felt really good too that it was my favorite car. And when I talked to Ron Conway, who is the senior vice president of operations uh, on Conrail to the end, speaking with Ron Conway, he said, I really liked that car as well. And Carl Kennedy remembers whenever this car went out, Ron Conway was on it. Uh, Ron Conway told me, uh, no, again, I wasn't officially assigned to Conrail one, but it didn't get used without me knowing. And when it did get used, I knew exactly where it was. So what I'm going to do is just give you a brief overview of this car in particular to kind of show you the level of detail that we go to in the book. Of course, there's still stuff that's, that's not, it can't talk about uh, right now tonight, but office car. So that sticker in the top was a photograph I took. The Southern office cars um, all featured this on the end doors, uh, Conrail 4 and Conrail 1, back from their Southern roots. It stayed just like this, and it stayed for the, like this for a while on Norfolk Southern as well. So let's talk about Conrail 1. Conrail 1 was built in 1920 as a car named Shannon, which was a 12-section, one-drawing-room sleeper. Now, some of your Conrail documents say it was built in 1927. We've been able to track that down. That's incorrect. That's why you have to cross-check, double-check. Uh, there are inaccuracies in Conrail documentation. Um, so the correct date for this car was 1920. It was rebuilt after that uh, sleeper to a 13 section sleeper for troop train service in 1941. And then Southern Railway purchased it in 1943. They rebuilt it to a dinette coach. And it wasn't until 1964 that the Hain Car Shop in Spartanburg, South Carolina rebuilt this car 
into office car number 10. So now it is an official office car for the first time. Similar to Penn Central, Southern Railway also changed their numbers quite a bit on their office cars. So what is an office car? So the answer is it is literally a home away from home. The Southern Railway used their office cars um, to, they were actually assigned to an executive and that executive did live on those cars or at least travel with them quite a bit, some more than others. The car would be the executive. They would have a secretary, which was usually a male and they would have a chef and they lived on those cars. So it was literally a living room, bedrooms, dining rooms, and kitchens. It was a self-contained office. The rear observation room of the car was over 12 foot uh, by nine foot. It sat eight people in there. It had two beds with uh, bedrooms, I'm sorry, with cherry bureaus and private bathrooms, which were absolutely fantastic if you're traveling to have your own space like this. The dining room sat eight people and it slept two. That's right, the dining room slept two because they had Murphy beds that pulled down uh, out of the walls and they were still there on Conrail days as well. Although I don't know, I have never heard any stories of actually anyone using them, but it'd be good to find out. The front of the car, which I always think of would be the observation end. The observation end of an office car is actually the rear of the car. The front of the car is the opposite end, had a kitchen, an electrical cabinet, and a crew room. So Stanley Crane wanted his office car from Southern Railway, and he purchased it. This particular car was purchased on something called AFE ZK90 on 12-20-1982 for $100,000 is what uh, they had Conrail purchased it for. What's an AFE? An AFE, and we talk about this in the book as well, is something called an authorization for expenditure. Uh, and anything that was about $100,000 up required board approval. I think that's true. Uh, it was a pretty high number. Uh, so he couldn't just go out and buy something. So this was the Stanley Crane approving uh, the purchase of his car. By the way, $100,000 today would be about $280,000 for that one car. So there it is, Southern 3. I think it's absolutely beautiful. I love that car. Uh, Southern Railway, uh, we have documentation from, uh, from Southern about the transition and the sale from Southern to Conrail. And they did a fantastic job of including checklists and everything else you'd ever want to know about this car for the Conrail crews to be able to maintain it when they purchased it. I'm sure that they got a little more cooperation because they, they were selling it to L. Stanley Crane, who rode these cars before. But regardless, the Southern Railway kept these cars in really good shape. Every three to four years, according to the documentation, they were cycled through the shop which means they were repainted, they were clean, they took the windows out, they put new rubber in the windows and reinstalled everything. And the list of what they do at the Hain shop goes on and on and on. Really cool thing about this letter is that towards the end, uh, Coleman Harvey is talking to, sending this letter to the Conrail crews and he talks about the exact week that he's going to come out uh, and show the Conrail crews at Reading how to maintain this car. So pretty cool documentation and down to a level of detail that could have easily been lost, but thankfully it won't be now with this book. Here it is on its way to become Conrail. So there is Conrail number one, which was the former Southern Railway three. You can see that they have painted out above the windows in the center the Southern Railway is now painted over. And instead of it saying number three for office car three, it has now been uh, stenciled with a number one, which is now Conrail one. Not much changed on the exterior of this car between when you see it here and later on in Conrail use, some underbody equipment, things like that. Another cool thing, little step stool on the observation platform. I'd give anything to have that. When it got to Conrail, we know the interior designer who actually uh, recommended to put this carpet and all of these things into this car. 
And her name is Aunt Nancy L. Rogers. She worked for the Southern Railway. Um, the carpet color is turkey red. Just in case you want to know, that is the official color of the car. Uh, I bet you not many people knew that there was turkey red in the car. The draperies were all done in ivory color. So a very simple interior. Many of the Southern office cars looked just like this minus the colors. So you would see different color carpets, um, but otherwise that's pretty much what they, what they look like. Interesting thing at the back of the buffet, at the bottom, uh, like at the bottom of the buffet, you'll see like a little pull down tray. That was for the male secretary to sit and work. He did not have his own private space. He was not allowed to go into the observation room it was with the executive. That was his work office right there at the back there. And it's still there on Conroe days. But things get updated. All right, now I know it's green. It's a lot of hunter green. Keep in mind, this is the 1990s, not now. But back then, this was very modern. Um, and the Conrail crews actually updated this in the 1990s to this shade of green, which again, like I said, looks kind of hideous now. But back then, this was great. Um, the Conrail crews also worked with an interior designer. Uh, they would interior designer would come through the car. They would make recommendations about what color drapes, what color carpet, uh, what kind of furniture should be used in the car. So they would come through. They would go, uh, the miscellaneous shop too, Carl Kennedy, would work with Philadelphia to get her plans approved. And once those plans were approved, Carl Kennedy and or Foxy back in the Reading days were the ones to install everything, which is why I said earlier they had an upholsterer because they would actually reupholster the furniture that was already there. They didn't just get rid of stuff and put new stuff in there. The dining room chairs in that car have been there for a long time. So they would reupholster that. They would install the carpets themselves. They would put new vinyl on the walls and they would hang up new curtains. So the miscellaneous two shop could do just about anything you needed to for these cars. And they maintained them really, really well. Not much else happened to this car during Conrail's years. It did get a new generator. So it went from a DC generator, they uh, updated it to an AC DC generator. Outside of that, it looked pretty much just like this until, there it is. Uh, I'll go back and just say this. So that's the car back in Conrail uh, paint. And that's when uh, uh, Ron Conway was telling me about uh, him using the car whenever he could. Other interesting story from Ron Conway about this car. He wanted this car to go with him to CSX in the merger. And he did everything he could to try to get Conrail One to go to CSX in the split. Now, I'm not taking sides. I'm just stating facts. Norfolk Southern, according to Ron Conway, would not give him the car and said that was a former Southern car. We want it back. It's ours. So he did not get it in the end, and it went off to Norfolk Southern. So when it went to Norfolk Southern, it was not immediately repainted. It went, uh, it went just like this. And what you see is the removal of the Conrail can openers. You see the removal of the Conrail lettering and the Conrail number. And in place of that, you see NS5 in a couple different spots, which is very similar to what happened when it was on, when it came to Conrail. It was the same thing. Everything got painted out, but Conrail put the numbers on it. Now, Norfolk Southern was doing the same thing. It got repainted into uh, Norfolk Southern Red. Nothing really changed from its Conrail days at this point. And the interior stayed the, it, pretty much the exact same from back in the 90s. The only difference was, I believe, before the end of Conrail, they got white uh, vinyl on the walls instead of the green. Otherwise, everything you see in here is exactly the way that it appeared on Conrail until... 2015, and the car was completely rebuilt, and it now looks like this. This is a photo taken uh, on March 31st of 2018. That office car with that same configuration lasted from Southern to Conrail into Norfolk Southern in that configuration for 51 years before it was changed into this configuration. And this configuration is completely different. Uh, as you can see, there is nothing left of uh, the Southern Railway uh, official the Southern Railway, uh, you know, uh, interior. What you see here are theater type seats. These can be removed. 
the whole section there can be completely taken out. Uh, and here's another photograph of the car. And you can see that those theater seats are out and you can actually see just regular uh, couches and chairs. Dining room is up here now. It's got what two, I think two or three bedrooms in the back and a very, very tiny kitchen, but the car is basically entirely different. Like I said before, we've got all the diagrams. We got underbody diagrams. Those are pretty hard to find. I don't think Brock and I even knew they existed until 2020. So those are in the book for as many of the cars as we could find. So that's the level of detail that we go down to. Knowing the color of the turkey red carpet is pretty detailed. I'm gonna wrap up now uh, with going back to the people because all that was about steel. Um, the people that told these stories, this book became theirs because even when we talk about the steel, we talked about them maintaining and own and working on these cars. It became their story. I was no longer telling a story about steel. I was telling about what they did with the stuff. Um, this is the track geometry train. Uh, you can see that this was a, actually a posed photograph that, uh, for Conrail, but they show um, how they work. This is old time stuff, but again, it was brand new back then. Um, Bill Mayer, who was uh, the electronic measuring systems of the track geometry train, did an absolutely fantastic job of telling us exactly how this equipment was used. I didn't even have to write a single thing for it. I feel kind of bad for not making him an author, but the reality is why change the story when he wrote it best? He told us every single detail about the time that the geometry car was built to the time it got new trucks, to the time that it derailed, to the time that it was blown up. I did say blown up to all these different things happened to this car. He told us, I didn't tell that story. And the same thing happened with our technical services team. We got into all the super detail with what they did on the uh, train as well. Uh, absolutely classic photo from 5 1999. Is it the last? Well, it's kind of hard to say because everybody we talked to rode the last train and it could be that it was the last of that portion, but tracking down the exact last train was difficult, but this is pretty darn close to the end of June 1st, 1999 when Conrail went away. To the very far left, you'll see Carl Kennedy and to the very far right, you'll see uh, Jim Smith, who was uh, in charge of all of the crew. And you can see all the fantastic porters and chefs on the platform as well. This uh, was another, uh, we got their stories. These are the guys that organized train trips on the system. We got to tell their story. So we got to tell the story from all these different perspectives. Uh, and in this case, this is Doug Watts in the center there. Uh, and uh, he had organized this train uh, for his department on Conrail. Ron Conway did a really good job of, of explaining uh, how the equipment was used and why it was the way that it was. Uh, he told me that Richard Hasselman was critical in the ultimate success and the transformation of those cars. Uh, he said it was, he was very involved with the train, making sure that the changes matched what he wanted. Mr. Crane was the guy who got it started. Mr. Hasselman was the guy that kept it going. And Ron Conway was the lucky guy that got to use it. So we got to tell the stories about trains themselves. We have a couple different types of trains. We tried really, really, really hard to not make this a book about Pennsylvania and the office car special. We tried to go out and find photographs and stories from outside of Pennsylvania. So you can see we've got Michigan, Ohio, and Massachusetts. These are stories about how the train was used from the people that organized and ran those trains. They're not my stories, the stories of the people. The technical services lab, you have more information that I guarantee you didn't know about all the different types of things that they did in the technical services from testing creosote, from testing paint, from testing ballast to make sure that the, uh, there was not a, a lot of conductivity in the ballast that would mess with the signal systems. There was a lot of things that they did, including project and electrical work, which is where the Conrail 20 and then eventually the Conrail 19 came into play. But again, the stories of the technical services lab, which is more than you probably know, at least I didn't know, um, is really detailed and it came straight from their mouth, which is really, really great. Track measurement train, we've got that section 
Uh, and in my last, uh, my second to last slide, again, this is their story. And it didn't start that way, but boy, did it end that way. And it was a really great and a really fun project. I'm happy to have worked with Brock in it. I'm happy to have written as much as I have. I'm happy that I got a couple things to collect from the train uh, and Brock didn't get those. So I'm glad that I have some stuff. But these are the people that, can, that contributed. There's some big names, Jim Hagen, Ron Conway, Mark Owens, Larry Myers, Bill Gentleman, the, the story goes on and on. And I can't thank everybody enough because this is their book as much as is my book. And I'll end the same way that uh, we started, which is that um, this is uh, Richard Hasselman uh, in the theater car, Conrail number nine. Again, in the winter, they weren't babied, they were used, but this is their story. And uh, I'm so honored to have worked on it, to have worked on the histories, to work with the photographers that contributed and to have worked with Brock to make it a reality. So thanks everybody. So just a, a quick recap on, on how the book came together. Um, what's nice is Wes did a lot of the writing and we both had been doing over 15 years of research on our own. So we did not combine that research initially because we wanted to double check everything that we both had found on this. So we presented Wes's research throughout the book and then I took my research and double checked and triple checked to make sure that we don't have any errors in, in, the, in this. So that was a great way to make sure 100% that what we're giving you, the, the, the diagrams, the dates, all that kind of stuff is fact. Um, so how the book came together, the, the first section is kind of a chronological. Here's, here's the business train from 76 through 99. Here's what happened with it, how it um, changed and so forth. And then we have all those amazing stories. Um, Wes talked a little bit about the card game. There's crazy, crazy stories in this book that you couldn't believe uh, unless you were writing a, a screenplay. Um, explosions and um, explosives being put on the geometry car, helicopters, uh, tomatoes, um, <laughs> yeah. toilet, toilets being changed out um, at, a, at a stop. In the, mass, the, right, yeah. <laughs> yeah the, the stories go on and on, and I, I'm so thankful that we're able to tell those stories, and especially, you know, the star. The, the business train was always the star, but the laboratory, the research trains, those stories have never been told. Those people have never been able to really publicly get the information out on what they did. And this book became their megaphone. And I'm so proud of that, that their stories are finally being told because what they did for Conrail in making it an innovator in safety or um, trackage or, you know, whatever it was, it all started back there in the work that they did. So the back half of the book, it's all the details. It's the, it's the nuts and bolts, the rivets, stuff that you probably don't want to know about the cars because it goes into so much detail, but it's there for you. It's saved for history. And I'm so thankful um, that we were able to get all of that. So I really hope you know, you do enjoy the book if you're able to get a copy. And um, it's been it's been a blast um, putting so much time into what will become one of my life's legacies. And it was the best time um, to work with with Wes on this. So thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you guys, especially for putting all this information in one place. As you said, these are untold stories. Um, I have some connections to those trains and that equipment and, and heard some of those stories. And Tri-State is closely related to the business train. Um, Dick Hasselman's counsel is a guy named John Fiorella, who was a, a member of the Tri-State board going back to the 70s. And John would come to the board meetings with, uh, looking for ideas on where to run that train because Hasselman wanted to run it at least once or twice a year. And John would pick up the itinerary. So, the port, so we would pick exotic routings like the Port Road trip and um, uh, Buffalo Line um, and, and the Chemical Coast that, that got Stanley Crane so upset. That was something that, that Fiorella put together. And what was neat is that he would, he would or he, we'd, we'd come up with these clever routings for, for his business train 
And then we'd get an excursion on it for Tri-State with NJ Transit Equipment uh, not long after that, or with Conrail Power. And uh, we always heard that the 1933 had some sort of special connection to the train, that it had a, a special electrical connection. So I guess that wasn't the case. They, the, the crews just liked it and wanted to keep it together. That they did, was they, they did have a, a, yeah, they had a communication connection between them, but that right. was it. They wanted you to think that it was because they didn't want to give it up. So well, that engine, always, that that engine a, was always specially cared for. It was one of the first ones to get the white stripes and the fancy yeah. lettering. That was when Conrail looked the best, when it had the frame stripes and the big and the, and, the, and the quality thing. So that engine was always well cared for. And yeah. and, and we as rail fans always love to see a track side because we knew it was special. You know? Yeah. So it also I had did. a passenger cut lever on the back, right? It did. It So the, the cut lever was down at the towards the bottom, which was always... Uh, they liked that because it made it difficult for freight conductors to want to use it. So they were kind of glad that it had that conductor, or that that uh, coupler bar, because it could That's stay with the, the 1933 more. Yeah. Now, now, I know it's probably too late for inclusion in a book, but I went out and got pictures of that Sanborn funeral train mm. uh, on the back of Amtrak. It was at Penn Station around two o'clock in the morning when it went through just to pay tribute to the guy. Everybody had, was so looking forward to what he would do with Conrail. And then we, we lost them so soon, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I'll tell I'll tell one last story. So my my favorite story in the book um, came from someone named Mark Owens, and Mark Owens was uh, responsible for uh, passenger operations on Conrail. So he was responsible for the movement of Office Car Special, in addition to any other passenger train that moved on Conrail, he was responsible for. So for a short while, he was responsible for the train itself. He told us where he bought the cigars. He told us why, where he bought the alcohol for the train. Uh, so we know all that information. We've documented it in the book. But one of the favorite stories I have is that the, uh, a lot of the cars had fake flowers in them. Uh, and he hated the fake flowers. Uh, he was always like, can't we get real flowers for this thing? So one day, uh, it was about midnight, he said. Uh, around Youngstown, Ohio, he gathered up all the fake flowers. He threw them off the train on each platform as he went through. So somewhere along Youngstown, Ohio, there's a track maintainer that found many sets of fake flowers from the office car special out along the, the, run, the, the right of way. I thought that was hilarious. So There was uh, one trip, got invited to ride it from Harrisburg to Horseshoe and back to Belitzen. And... Um, I was a member of the media then, so I, you know each of us had cab time. So mine was on the way back. So at Lewistown, they stopped to let people off, and then I, I walked through the engines to get to the cab for the ride to Harrisburg eastbound from Lewistown, and, and they didn't waste any time taking off. So I'm in the lead unit between the two prime movers as this thing accelerated. So I just stood there and grooved on that. That was an incredible experience. And by the time I got up to the cab, they were doing 79 miles an hour. And those engines rode like Cadillacs. It was yeah. it was a it was a great experience. You know, this was okay. the forty this was the forty twenty. They were green. I met the guy who was responsible for painting them, and he wanted to paint them uh, Tuscan red. And I thought that was a great move because Conrail's business train always had engines the same color as a train, and that just never looked right. You know, right? The blue train looked silly, and then the and, and uh, the green ones looked like UPS trucks. You know, so it'd be nice to have. Them, <laughs> you know. <laughs> But the, now you, you documented the color green. Did you document the color gold? Because it was darker than Dulux gold. Yeah, the the uh, the, the color gold was certainly um, special, and they were they were not painted. They were actually decals um, that were applied onto the the Conrail Pullman green paint. I wondered that because the locomotives, they did look painted on the locomotive. Those were decals on the locomotive, too. They were decals, yeah. Yeah. yeah after time, you could start to see the decals starting to chips in the corners and, and those yeah. sorts of things. So you could see the wear and tear on them. Um, and there's there's some other sidebars, you know, within the book. Uh, Conrail had two police passenger cars at a time. We talk a little bit about those. Uh, we talk about Conrail's commitment to Operation Lifesaver. Um, and some of the pieces that they used with that. Um, so there's also, you know, really neat sidebars. We have we feature a lot of the artifacts that I've collected over the years uh, from the, the train itself. 
um, and, and there are stuff a lot that, of artifacts in the book. Yep, and stuff that Wes <laughs> has as well. So uh, there's there's something for everybody uh, within the pages for sure. Nice, nice. Well, again, thank you guys for putting all this stuff in one place because um, there's little segments of it have made it into print. And again, when I was a journalist, you used to have to write about little sections of it, but never the big picture like you guys did. So terrific. Good it's job. Our honor. Our honor. Yeah. Completely Good. our honor. And thank you for uh, the invitation this evening. Yeah, thank you very much. I got to oh. hand it to you, Rudy. You finally found some but two people that are more detailed than I am. <laughs> <laughs> you should see the kind of stuff we left out of the book. Oh, gosh. Yeah, right. So, oh, so Brock showed up here. So we, we were taking some photos and stuff for the artifacts to put in the book. And Brock shows up here with an entire carload of stuff to take photos of. Um, one of the things that the, the photo did not make it into the book because it was just it was just too detailed of an item was the fuel filler adapter. Brock, do you want to mention that real quick? Because it's not in the book, so you're not going to yeah, give it away. Yeah, I have, uh, you know, I have a ton of the stuff from the the trains themselves. So, um, when a locomotive is being filled from a fuel truck, it, it you need a Houston fuel adapter. So I have the Houston fuel adapter for 4022 that you would need um, if if you were going to refill that engine. And you know, I have stuff. I have tons of stuff like like that the, i know where you live board. brock <laughs> yeah i mean i have i have the number boards for all the locomotives i mean it goes on and on and on and you'll you'll see you'll see maybe i don't know 20 percent of what i have um within the book wow. nice nice well thank you guys we definitely appreciate um it's a wonderful presentation we actually like peaked at like 96 attendees great Cool. That, that, that is great and it would be nice to see where these cars wind up ultimately um you know so and and uh conrelocs.com will be a repository for us in the future stuff that you know we find out stories pictures afterwards that's where it's going to end up where you know we're going to keep um pumping the information into uh the website so uh post book anything that comes to us because like Wes said, we have people coming to us all the time with stories or, or things. Um, we were very lucky with a that's, lot of timely uh, things during the- That's, the, a, that's uh, a great idea. And it's a nice thing about the digital era is that you can, you can post addendums and, and, and stuff. And when I, when I come across those pictures of the Sanborn train, I'll send, I'll, I'll send one to you so you can put it there. Love it. We'd love to see it. Yeah. Cause, yeah. It, cause it should be, it was uh, you know, ASA 3200 black and white film because it's two o'clock in the morning at Penn Station, Newark, which wasn't well lit, but it is what it is. It was, yeah, a, it, it was the event. It was published. Um, and when I find pictures of the business train I took, you know, uh, dome car looking across horseshoe curve, all that stuff, you know, all the, all the classic trite stuff, you know, so. Great. great. <clears throat> All right, guys. Cool. Well, thank thank you for everything, and uh, get that this uh, presentation up on uh, our page and share it with you, so you can link that onto your page as well. Great. Thank and, you. Uh, Thanks again. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Okay. All right. Yeah. Good night, everybody. Next month it's the anniversary of the Phoebe Snow, so Dave Monteverdi will be here, and uh, you know, uh, give us a presentation of the Phoebe Snow from end to end. So. Great. Good we'll time. see everyone then. Thanks yep. a lot. Good night. Good night. Thanks.